thou goest. Then Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then in verse 59, and he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid farewell, which are at my home in my house. Now Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and look back is fit for the kingdom of God. And there's another verse, well, another scripture found in Matthew 25. And we know in Matthew 25, starting in verse 21 through 13, it speaks of the ten virgins. And I think we all know that story. It said five was wise and five was foolish. For time's sake, I'm not going to read all that, but I will come back to that for emphasis sakes. What I'm speaking about is called procrastination. Procrastination. What is procrastination? Procrastination is the act of willfully delaying the doing of something that you know you should be doing. Procrastination is putting off until tomorrow what you should be doing today. And mastering this problem is very difficult for most of us. Mastering this problem, we have to learn to put what we say our priorities in perspective. We all struggle with that. We all struggle with that. Even King David said, You have made my days a mere handbreadth, and the span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. That's Psalms 39, 4 and 5. The King James Version said, Lord, make me to know my ends and my measure of my days. What is it? that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days a hand breath, and my age is nothing before thee. Verily, every man, every man at his best, at his best, is altogether vanity. And Apostle James also mentioned something similar to that, James 4 and 14. Whereas you know not what you shall be on tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanish away. The Apostle Paul, he warns us to be very careful of what we do while we're here on earth, how we live our lives, that we must use our time wisely and not as unwise or not as fools, but use it wisely. Ephesians 5, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And I mentioned this once before, and someone said, well, you shouldn't call anyone a fool. I'm not calling you a fool. It's in your Bible. It's in our Bible. It's in the Bible that we should not walk as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And so we all are guilty. All of us are guilty of procrastinating at some time or another. We're all guilty of that. Sometimes we procrastinate because we might just be tired. Sometimes we procrastinate because we just don't know how to get our priorities in perspective. Sometimes we might procrastinate because we might not how, know how to tackle a project. So we just keep putting it off. And some of us are just, we have a, a complex of taking a test. We have a complex of completing something. If you give someone a timeline to complete something, a lot of times they will freeze up. But if you just tell someone to go about and do something and they enjoy doing it, they'll do that and they'll complete it with no problem. But we all have a problem. We struggle with that sometime or another. And it's frustrating, and we get that. It's very frustrating. But like I said, while the Bible does not mention the word procrastination, 
we can still find biblical principles to apply to this problem that we have. Sometimes that procrastination is what we say. A lot of times people do not like to hear. It's just being plain lazy. It's just being plain lazy. Now the Bible does speak about being lazy. It doesn't speak in terms of procrastination, but it does speak of being lazy. And we find a lot of that in the book of Proverbs. And you look in the book of Proverbs 15 and 19. The way of a slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. Proverbs 18 and 9. He also that is slothful in his work is the brother of him that is a waster, a great waster. Meaning, you lazy, you slow for and doing anything, you don't accomplish anything, you're equal to the same as someone that's wasting, going out there doing something they shouldn't be doing. Both of you are wasting time. Even though you're not doing anything, you're equal to the one that's doing something that's negative. He's not doing anything positive, he's wasting time. So you're just the same, you're the brother. What the Bible does say about lazy, and first of all, let me say this, and a lot of you might have heard this before. Newton's law, his first law of motion states that an option in motion tends to stay or remain in motion, and an object at rest tends to remain at rest. And that law applies to people also. Because a lot of us, myself, I found myself guilty of this. We do this. Some of us are naturally driven to complete a project, like I said. Some of us have that knack. It just comes to them. But many of us, many of us, we just unconcerned, kind of lazy a little bit, unsure, not knowing what to do, or how we're going to go about doing this. So we just remain, we just remain useless or not doing anything, sluggish, inert. We need a kickstart. We need something to kick us out off that sofa, something to, to jumpstart us like your car, battery, when it goes dead. That's how some of us are. We just had battery. We just sitting there, not doing anything. We need a jump start. And I'll get to that later on because our brothers and sisters of Christ can help us jump start us to get us up doing things that we should be doing for the Lord. Like I said, laziness sometimes is a lifestyle for others and it's a temptation for all of us because we all are tempted not to do things at some point in time. It's a temptation not to do anything. It feels good to just relax. It feels good. Just lay there in the bed. It feels good. Sit back on the sofa and watch television. It feels good to play those games. But I'll get into that later. But it does. Sometimes it feels good. And sometimes we need something to jump stories to get us out of that. But the Bible is clear. Because the Lord has ordained work for men. He has ordained work for us. Laziness is a sin. Go to the ant, you slugger. Consider her ways and be wise. Proverbs 6 and 6. Then the Bible has a great deal to say about laziness. Proverbs tells us that a lazy person hates to work. A lazy person hates to work. Proverbs 21 and 25. The desire of a slothful kills him in the hands, for his hands refuse to work. He refused to work because he desire to be lazy and not do anything. He that loves sleep, Proverbs 26 and 14, as a door turned on his hinges, so does the slothful man in his bed. You have a door on the hinge. That door moves a lot. Those doors move a lot. We walk in and out. The door's moving. It's a lot of work in those doors, but they go nowhere. A slothful man will lay in his bed. He'll toss and turn. He'll roll. He knows he should get up. Or he might roll over to grab something to eat, a drink. Slow for laziness. Not going to get up. He would not get up. He's not obtaining, not doing anything useful. That's the same thing he's saying here. And we have those that give excuse all the time. 
Now, you know those. There are many of us always have an excuse for not doing something. Many of us. And I know I've worked with some that every time I say something or tell them to do something, they have an excuse why they couldn't accomplish that. Many Marines would tell me many a times why they could not accomplish. There's so many of them that right now at this point in time, I don't believe any of them. Even those that might be telling the truth. Because there's so many of them that have excuses why they could not do something. Proverbs 26, 13 says that a slothful man would say, there's a lion in the way, there's a lion in the street, rather than going around, find another way to get there. Or said the smallest little thing, the smallest little obstacle would avoid, would stop you from accomplishing what you need to accomplish. And again, we recall, he that is a great waster, Proverbs 26, 13. He also said that a slowful, a slowful man in his works is like the brother of a great waster. And then you have those that believe they are wise. They believe that they know more than anyone else. They have a reason, a great reason, why they should not accomplish anything. Proverbs 26, 16 says, The slugger is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Proverbs has a lot to tell us about laziness. Proverbs also tells us the end of a lazy man. A lazy person becomes a servant of a debtor. Diligence hands will rule, but a lazy, the lazy person, the laziness of a person will call him to come to ends of being a slave, a labor, that he will work for that diligent person because the diligent would rule. He tells us that. Proverbs also tells us a slugger does not plow in season. A lazy man will not plow in season. So at harvest time, he will have nothing. When he looked to find his food or his fruits or his produce, he will have nothing because he didn't go out there and work. He didn't perform. He didn't do anything. He was in his slowful laziness ways that he didn't do anything. The slugger would not plow when it's season, when it's time to plow. He may become improvident. The slowful, excuse me, the soul of a lazy man desire and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. If you look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. There's no room for laziness in the life of a Christian. As a Christian, we should not be lazy. As a new Christian, new Christians can be misled, thinking, as we say, that it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. A new baby in Christ might be confused with that, thinking, I really don't have to do anything because it tells me I'm going to be saved anyway. So why should I work? Why should I do anything? But a Christian can become, as you say, greatly misled as a new baby in Christ, so we should encourage them, as the Bible says, that we have been transformed with a new creature. So now that we're transformed, we should have a desire to do the work of the Lord. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That is also found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10. Christians are not saved by works, but we show our faith by our works. And James, the book of James tells us this, 2 and 18. But we know we must work. So we should encourage new babes in Christ that they should work. Slothfulness goes against God's promise. Slothfulness goes against God's good work because God has ordained work for us. 
And God himself has worked for us. God himself has sent his only begotten son to this earth. That what will Jesus do? That he will go out and seek to save the lost. He's working. Our Lord and Savior gave us a great example. So we must work. Use that example. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are, are became, become new. A new creature. We are a new nature. We are a babe in Christ. We have put off the sinful things. We have put off all the sluggishness of not doing anything. We have a new creature. Now, Ephesians 4, as Paul wrote to them, verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, because that's what a lazy person would do. A lazy person, when you don't work, when you don't do anything, you don't have anything to take care of yourself, first of all, so that you can continue to work and take care of others. So what do you do? You have to go out and steal. Are you big? And when a push comes to a shove, when you get desperate, you will find yourself stealing. So you can survive. So Ephesians 4, 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that need it. We should do this. And also take care of your families because it tells them we are convicted as new creatures that we must provide for our families through labor. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith. And he is worth, he is worth as an infidel, worthless. He's nothing as an infidel. Provide for others in your family, as God has told us. Acts 20, 34 and 35. Ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. And then 35. I have showed you all things how that you should labor and all to support for the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. As a Christian, we should know that we should labor. As a Christian, we should know that God has ordained for us to work. But most important of all, as a Christian, we should have a desire to work for the Lord. You love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. You love God, you will do these things. It will compel you to work. No one should tell you to work. Now we're going to bring it home a little bit as we talk about how, as Christians, what Christians should do. And for time's sake, I want to go back. Actually, I'm going to go back to what we've talked about. In the book of Luke, Chapter 9, verse 57. If you look at that verse, 57, there's a couple things you need to look at and focus at. And I know most of the time we use this, uh, we're talking about how Jesus is telling them how the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. But I want to use this uh, for a different um, understanding because you know, all scriptures are written for our understanding and for our learning. So in, in um, the first uh, verse 57, and it came to pass that as they went in their way, a certain man said to him, he said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow thee wherever thou go. But then Jesus told him about, you know, the son of man have nowhere to lay his head. Then in verse 59, you see, he, and he said unto another, now Jesus said to another, follow me. But that individual said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And that's what we do. God tells us to do something. We say, well, I get around to that, Lord. First, let me do this. I will follow you. Give me one moment, Lord. Let me watch the game first. 
when I finish this game, I'll, I'll do what you, what you want me to do. It's kind of like what we do as Christians nowadays. Back then, he was using that metaphor because they understood, using the parable for them to understand that time. Then the other individual, as you go on, it says, in verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. Yeah, I'm ready to follow you. But, and we hear that a lot, but, when you hear that but, you know something is wrong. I'm going to follow you, but let me first go bid farewell to my family. And it's, it sounds like a normal thing. And normal thing is what we would do in this day and age. Before I go on a, a missionary, I'm going to fly to another country. But first, I'm going to take some time with my family here. Jesus said, you need to go ahead and follow him and do his will first. Because what did he tell them in verse 62? And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hands on the plow. And a lot of you don't understand, but that's different like plowing in the field. We're not talking about that, but he used that metaphor for them. And look back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No man. So when we look back, God tells us to do something. And we decide to put God second. We put him next. Third, fourth, fifth, or whatever. We don't put him first. You're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Don't look back. God did not design the kingdom of heaven to be put second. The kingdom of heaven should not be put second. Be first, be first only. Now I'm going to go ahead and jump back over to give you some more examples here about procrastination or being lazy. However you want to put it, they're both the same. They equal one another's. God wants us to be free from sickness and free from sorrow. He wants to be free from even being lazy because he tells us this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We should work. We should be diligent in everything that we do. Colossians 3.23 And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord and not unto man. And sometimes our to-do list, as I said, to bring it home, our to-do list is the problem that we have. And sometimes that's the only way most of us can get anything accomplished. We have to do a right uh, to-do list. And some of us might do this by having post-its, a little yellow post-its on our refrigerator or um, your bathroom when you wake up in the morning and remind you to do something or on the job you have a little post-it or whatever. Some of us um, create a list of to-do things and some of us might just, uh, you know, you have that app on your phone nowadays where you can create the list on your phone of to-do things. Um, the trick to this is really knowing, like I said before, our priorities. We need to put everything in perspective of what we need to do. It's very tricky for most of us to do this. But if you want to do this, and we all know, put God first. Ask God to guide you in what you do. And we know this in Philippians 4, 13, so I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So why should we procrastinate? If you feel yourself getting that slumber, that slump as a Christian, just ask God to help you. Because God will. The Bible says there are some things that we should not put off. We should not procrastinate. Like making up with friends in Matthew 5 and 23, 25. I think we all read that before. Therefore, if I bring a gift to the altar, that you should remember that brother, I'll have all the gifts you first. And so you have to leave that gift and go and reconcile with your brother first. So God tells us that, and that we should agree with him quickly. Also in Ephesians 4, 26, it says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. When it comes to sharing the truth of the, truth of the gospel, when it comes to sharing the truth of the gospel, we should definitely should not wait. We should not put that off. We should not procrastinate. 
And that's where I'm going. We should not procrastinate on that. If you want to do something better with your life, think about that by sharing the gospel. Do not put off sharing the gospel. And when I'm saying this, I'm, I'm preaching to myself because there are some times that I found that I could have been sharing the gospel, but I put it off because I might have said this is not the correct time. When is the correct time? When is the best time? On your job, most of us, if you work in an environment where the government is involved, you have to be very careful about bringing religions to the workplace. So what do we do? We kind of back off a little bit. We're not sure when we should say anything. But I think we need to step up and just get bold with that. Someone's come to you and mentioned anything about God, anything about the Bible, anything about religion, they have opened themselves up. So we should take that moment, seize the moment, jump right in right then. Someone come to you and say, pray for me. Jump right in because they'll open the door. And most of I know myself, and I know, I've heard others speak of this, that on the job, at school, some individuals recognize you as being something different. They might not know what it is, but in time of need, they come to you and ask you to pray for them because they know it's something different about you. So what do you do? Or what should we do? We should jump in and seize the moment. Take advantage of it. Do not procrastinate. Don't put it off. Jesus himself gave us a metaphor about evangelists in Luke 14, 21. When he talks about a man inviting people to the banquet. And then he went on and he told them to go into the alleys, the streets and alleys, and bring in the poor and the crippled, the lame, the blind. And he told them to do this quickly. He didn't say maybe tomorrow. He said do this quickly. Also, Choosing his disciples. When Jesus chose his disciples, if you look at the book of Matthew, chapter 4, 18 through 20, when Jesus was walking on the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother. They were casting their nets, for they were fishers. And then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And we understand that. That's good. But take this next verse as an example. I'm going to say it one way. And they said, let me go bid farewell. No, they didn't say that. They didn't say, let me wait. They didn't say, let me pull these fish in first. They didn't say, let me help my father with this. The Bible said, and they straightway left their nets. Now they pull in fish. They are fishermen. That's their job. They pull in all these fish. That's their job. Now Jesus come along and promised them a better job. He promised them a better job. They straightway just dropped their net and followed Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Straightway. Some of us have a job working for the corporate world, making a lot of money, buying big houses, cars, you can buy anything you want to buy. And you're working so diligent for the corporate world. And then Jesus come and said, I need you to come work for me. Take all that knowledge you have working for this corporate world and bring it over here and do the Lord's work. What do most of us do? I don't quite have time for that. I don't see any money in that. I can't do that. I, I, I'm sorry. I got to do this first. Guilty. We have to be careful with that. When I read that, I kind of really, many years ago I would read it and never see that. But then I start reading more and more as I grow. I'm looking at a lot of things that I have done wrong. So I hope that I'm growing as I learn this, but because if you don't grow as you learn this, there's a problem. Also in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, starting at verse 21, as Jesus went on, and going thenceforth, he saw another brother, James, and the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and he was in a ship, 
Um, and then he said to them, you know, he was catching their nets, and he told them the same thing. That he asked them, you know, to come and follow. And immediately they left their ship and left their father. Immediately. They didn't wait. They didn't procrastinate. They, they didn't put it off. So there's many um, examples in the Bible that, that tells us or give us a better understanding of what we should do and not procrastinate. Uh, we also, in the book of Luke, chapter 9, we see, like I said, the three individuals there, the one certain man that uh, he said, I'll follow you, but he didn't have any understanding of what he was going to be doing. And then one said that um, I need to go uh, bury my dead and bury my father. Uh, there are many things that we, we have excuses for, reasons we cannot do what God would have us to do. And then there are many reasons why we do not do things that we should be doing. There are many reasons why we procrastinate. And as I stated before, a lot of us, are, we are afraid. Uh, a lot of us, we don't have a great understanding of what we should do. We don't have that in order yet. Time management is the problem that we have. We need to learn good time management. And when you learn good time management, it takes the fear out of doing things. When you learn good time management and you're better prepared for something, it takes the fear out of something. And we all understand this. When you're not ready for something, most of us, if you're just thrown into something right away, fear jumps in right away. How can I accomplish this? What am I going to do? What should I say? So we have fear. But as Christians, we should always be prepared. Well, we don't know when the Son of Man is coming. So always be prepared and use our time wisely. And this method of using this time wisely for all of us, it depends on you as an individual because each and every one of us have a different way of thinking how we should do most things. But the first thing you should do is put God first. You put God first, everything else will roll right into place. That's the problem. Put God first. And I'm pretty sure I have seen a lot of to-do lists, and I found myself doing this. My to-do list sometimes didn't even have God in it at all. And when I look, I said, whoa, it, it kind of scared you. It made me feel bad. I was convicted. And what I try to do, I try to squeeze it in at the top. When you try to squeeze it in at the top, it looked like you, now you're trying to squeeze in time for God. I got everything else. Oh, I forgot God. Now let me squeeze him in. I'm going to give him a little slither right here at the top. So small at the top that I barely even noticed that it's up there. So, I find myself taking that list and shred the whole list. And I start over. And I think that's what we all should do. If you find yourself not giving God that time, like Brother Mike spoke before, and I believe other brothers have said before, when you feel something, when you fill it up, and I'm going to just say this. When you fill it up with junk, you fill anything up with junk, there's no room for the good. You fill it up with all this negative, there's no room for good. When you feel something, when you fill your mind up with all this negativity, and I don't want to step in and toes, I have to watch myself, but your mind can really wander and have a lot of negative things in there. And before you know it, you'll, be, you'll forget some verses and scriptures that you have learned and things you know you should do. You almost forget it because now your mind's filled up with a, a bunch of you know what. And the, we know the television, internet, the media, and all this, the news. Uh, like Brother Mike said, first thing in the morning you wake up, you turn on the radio, the television, it fills your mind with all that. And before you know it, you, you forget to pray. Because you're filling your mind with other things that are not useless, things that are worthless. Once we get that list, once we get it figured out with that to-do list, once we make sure we put God on there first, and we ask God to help us and God to guide us because no God will give us that. If you ask God for anything, wholeheartedly, he will give it to you. You got to stick to it. You got to stick to what you do. You cannot decide to make this list and make this change and stop procrastinating and do not stick to it. Remember in Colossians 3 23 says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. 
knowing that the Lord shall receive the reward of inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. And also remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14.33. If you look at 14.33 in the book of 1 Corinthians. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of, of the saints. And then in verse 40, he says that all things be done decently and in order. So all that we do, God has ordained for everything be done in order. So don't fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be lazy. Don't procrastinate. Don't put off. And one of the things most important of all, the most important thing that you can tell anyone, if they're not in the body of Christ, do not procrastinate. Do not put off becoming a child of God. That is one thing, one thing that really will, how I say, it would hinder or it could be a problem because no one knows when God is coming. And if you're not a child of God, if you're putting it off, if you're saying I can do it some other time, if you're saying I got plenty of time, I'm young, I can continue to do this, one day I'll change. I'm young. I can keep on sinning a little bit. I can enjoy our life. Because I know brother whatever over there, I heard him say that he was baptized when he was in his 40s. I'm just in my 20s. I got plenty of time to sin. Do not put it off. Do not procrastinate. I know I'm going a little bit far with that, but that's sometimes what I believe we, as young people, I know I even said that when I left the church. I said I got plenty of time. I'm young. But we don't know. So do not procrastinate. Do not put off becoming a child of God before they're less too late. And if you're not a, a child of God, become a child of God. But we know that is the only way that you can receive the gift of eternal life. You have to be in it. As the old saying, you have to be in it to win it. If you're not in Christ, you're not going to receive that gift. You've got to be in it to win it. You've heard God's word, Romans 10, 17, so then faith come by hearing, hear by the word of God. Hebrews eleven six tells us, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. It is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God, you must come to him, you must believe. Don't come to God and not believe. You must believe that he is and that he will diligently reward you for diligently seeking him. Then repent, Luke 13, 3. It says the same thing in 5. I'll tell you no, but unless you repent, you all likewise perish. Then we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Matthew 3, 10, 32 tells us, Therefore, whosoever confess me before men, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. And in verse 33, it tells you, Whosoever deny me before men, then Jesus will deny you before his Father who is in heaven. And that's a hurtful thing. We don't want to be in that situation. Romans 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. For with the mouth one believes, excuse me, with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. And then we repent and be baptized. And Acts 2 38, then Peter told them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the Lord asked you to the church, as it did in Acts 2 47, praising God and having favor with all. But all the people, the Lord added, the Lord added to the church daily such as being saved. And then in Revelation 2.10, it tells us, do not be afraid of those things which you're going to suffer because the devil is going to throw some of you to prison. He's going to give you trials and tribulations for 10 days. But remain faithful until death and will give you the crown of life. Remaining faithful until death is a thing that we must do. As I was talking to one of the brothers um, this morning, kind of like in the Old Testament, when they was wondering, God was weeding them all out. As they was wondering, before they got to the promised land, they must remain faithful. Some did not. Some lost faith. But Moses went up on the mountain and lost faith. Same thing here. Sometimes we just, we're roaming this earth until Jesus comes. And during that time, we just remain faithful. We're going to fall. You're going to fall short sometimes, but ask God to forgive you. 
Do not lose faith. Do not fall short. If there's anyone that would like to put on Christ in baptism, anyone that have anything in their hearts, you can come right now as we all stand and sing the song of invitation. Come now. Runs as deep as it is wide. You know all our roads. You know all our fears. And words cannot express the love we feel. But we long for you to be. So listen to all. Listen to our heart.